there couldn't be a better description of how to optimize brain um, growth and development than Roger's uh, principles of, uh, you know, of warmth, compassion, positive regard, exploration, non-shaming, all of those things really are all in, in alignment with what we're discovering about the biochemistry and the neuroanatomy of development and growth. Okay? And so it's through linking up with other brains, in other words, creating um, a neural circuit that goes outside of us, that connects with other, uh, another person or other people, that allows us to modify um, our own brains. I, what's coming to mind now is sometimes I am, I am very tech unsavvy, um, don't know if it's my age or my lack of, uh, of cleverness when it comes to these things. But I love when I'm working with an IT person and they take over my screen and I'm watching them do things in front of me that would take me probably eight years to figure out and lots of YouTube videos and they're doing it and they're interacting with me. Kind of a model perhaps of, um, you know, of how we connect with therapists and, we, and therapists and clients connect and also how we connect with loved ones, with our children, um, across the board. I think one of the things that happens, for example, is that uh, when there is a dissociation for, in a client between right and left hemisphere function where someone's over-intellectualized and not aware of their emotions, we hopefully are more integrated between our right and left hemispheres. We're able to attune right hemisphere to right hemisphere with them, feel those feelings um, you know, resonate emotionally with our clients and do something they can't do, which is put words to those feelings, perhaps. And then we can take those words and offer them up as suggestions, stimulating Broca's area in their left hemisphere to see whether or not we can help build neural integration for them across networks. And so the social brain then, from my perception, is the primary lever, okay, of, uh, of growth and development in, in psychotherapy. Okay. The second principle that we're learning a lot more now is neuroplasticity. Okay, the brain is capable of change, and you've got to be careful not to be too um, grandiose or absolute about this. There are ways in which the brain is capable of changing, and ways in which it doesn't appear to be—at least so far. Um, we're still, you know, we're in the first days of our understanding of neuroscience, um, and it makes sense that there are things we can now change that we didn't know we could change before, but it's probably also true that there are sensitive periods of development, so there are some things that we may not be able to change. Right? But it's this neuroplasticity, it's our ability to grow new neurons, to change the relationship between neurons, to be able to learn new things, to integrate circuits that have been dissociated, that gives us the leverage to change the brain in ways that are more healthful. Okay? The third, the third piece is, um, is language storytelling and co-constructed narratives. And I hinted at this before um, when I talked about the importance of, uh, of language for integration. And it's not just important for neural integration. It's also important for the development of self and the connection to other people in our world. Okay, so language is a, you know, along with gestures and emojis and all these other things, just expand the notion of, of language. Language is, a, is serves as a blueprint for how we run our lives. In other words, every one of us has a kind of story. Part of the story of conscious is conscious. Part of the story is in our bodies. In other words, the um, there's uh, our bodies react in certain ways that are part of that story. So if we've been victimized, we might recoil or step back or do whatever. That's part of our narrative. So I just don't mean to to say that it's all um, all in words, but the the narrative is a blueprint. We look to the blueprint. We Daniel Dennett, the philosopher, said that our identity is the center of our narrative gravity. So it's the stories that we tell about ourselves, the stories that we that we feel about ourselves that organize our you know our well being. And the nice thing about this is that we when we engage with a client, we start telling. We start telling each other stories and therapists naturally start editing the stories or making su editorial suggestions to those stories. And you've probably had this experience if you're a therapist is that clients will come back and say, you know, I was about to do this thing and I was wondering what to do when I heard your voice in my head saying X, Y, and Z, hopefully something good. Okay. And so 
what happens then is that we invade our clients, hopefully with good stories or ed edits that help them restructure these narratives. Okay, one of my favorite uh, my favorite experiences was the I had a, I was working with a young boy, probably he was uh, a, uh, eight nine something like that, and um, his parents brought him to me because they were concerned that his um, his grandfather had passed away about six months earlier and his grandfather lived in the house with them. He was very close to them and he didn't seem that, that upset about it. And um, they were concerned that he wasn't ex you know, expressing his feelings and they were worried that it would have some other negative effect. So I said, well, you know, he certainly looks like he's doing fine for me, but uh, I'm always willing to, uh, to, you know, to spend time with young kids and hang out and play and do all of those things. So anyway, I saw him a few times, got to know him, um, enjoyed being with him, and uh, we just hung out, made paper planes, did, did things. And one day he mentioned that uh, he liked doing puzzles. So uh, I, between sessions, I was at a store, I saw some puzzles, and I brought one in. And before he came, I set it up on the table, did a few pieces, and wanted to see if he would notice it and, and care to play. And sure enough, after a few minutes of walking around the room, he saw it, he says, oh, can I put some of this together? And I said, sure. And as he was trying to do it, he, um, he was, I could see he was having trouble and I started to, to be concerned that perhaps I had uh, chosen a puzzle that was above his uh, or beyond his ability to do it. And I didn't want him to have a, you know, a negative experience. So I suggested that we could do something else if he wasn't enjoying it. And he said, no, no, I'll, you know, I, I want to keep at it. So he was sitting in the chair working at it and I was doing something, you know, uh, working on it in one of the corners. And I heard him sort of whispering to himself. And I leaned over closer and closer to hear what he was saying. And he was saying under his breath, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. And he was uh, just repeating the little, uh, the little engine that could. And you probably are aware of that story. And, um, you know, I asked him about it. And he said, yes, like that was one of his favorite stories that his grandfather always used to tell him. And um, that whenever he ran into something that was difficult, like a puzzle or even dealing with his, uh, with his grandfather's death, um, that he can do it. He can make it through. He can feel his feelings, but he, he wants to keep going. And he's the, he's the train that can make it over the hill. And I always think that's a wonderfully straightforward, simple, and beautiful version of how one way in which we use narratives to, um, you know, to be meaningful and to, and to guide us in our lives and also to regulate our affect. And when we lose our narratives, uh, and I, I saw this with Holocaust survivors, when they weren't when they didn't give themselves uh, permission or others didn't give them permission to talk about the experience, the trauma lingered and the effects of the trauma lingered. So it's a huge um, healing process and maybe that's what the talk talking cure is all about. Okay. Um, the fourth thing is self-reflective capacity. Um, we are actually able to think about ourselves uh, from a third person objective perspective. Now, I don't think that um, other primates are that self-reflective. They are aware of themselves. Some experiments have shown that. But I don't think they have anywhere near the self-reflective capacity that we do. But what they do have very strongly is the ability to develop a theory of mind of others. There's been so, many, so much research that shows that apes and chimps have an idea about what's going on in the minds of other chimps and apes and even humans, and they're able to use that information to predict outcomes and, uh, you know, and survive in a group uh, in a better way. And so um, I think that our theory of mind of others probably evolved first. And then from this theory of mind of others, we evolved the theory of self, which is why we evolve. We depend so much on narratives. We have a story about who we are. And we can use that and we can edit it and, and reflect on it. The other thing is when you think about uh, meditation and, and other variables, we have this, uh, this system called the default mode system that's been uncovered in the last 20 years or so. So there is a, a coherent neural system that becomes active when we're not attending to the outside world that is involved in both attunement and empathy, compassion for other people, but also self-awareness, self-reflection, and compassion and empathy for ourselves. And so one of the things that we have at our disposal, and this is where the meditation traditions of the East come in, is that we are capable 
of enhancing the activation and sophistication of these networks that are able to help us be aware of our bodies, of our, of our emotions, and to be more aware of ourself in three-dimensional space. And it's, this, and it's this capacity that is another thing that happens in, in therapy, and you probably have seen it. There are multiple levels of languages, you know, language in therapy. Clients will talk reflexively from their defenses. Sometimes they'll be able to talk about their defenses, sort of metacognition, so they, they, they uh, think about their thinking. But then when something is hitting home, when an interpretation hits home, or whether, whether there's, when there's self-insight, when you've got a combination of cognitive and emotional activation, you see people's posture change, their facial expressions change, the cadence and tone of their voice change. We're capable of going to this place where we reach this other level of self-reflection and language where we can look at ourselves and uh, consider ourselves and consider the things that we do past our defenses and be thinking about what we're doing from the perspective of what we like, what we don't like, how we can evaluate ourselves or, or consider ourselves as we consider other people. Okay. And finally, and this connects with, uh, with number four, number five is abstract thoughts and uh, an abstract thought and imagination. So we can create new thoughts. We can imagine new selves and we can figure out how to work in the direction of becoming, of embodying those selves. Okay. And we'll be, comes from the imagination of thousands of people over time, somatic therapy, um, EMDR, um, pharmacology, all of these things come from evolutions, a gift of evolution, which is to think abstractly, creatively, and come up with some, uh, with some good solutions for things. So I hope that um, you know, what I've done is to sort of present the shortcomings and then to end with a little bit more optimism about the things that we can, we can do about it. And I think that, you know, when you think about why therapy works, you know, just to, to get to uh, specifically that, that question, therapy works because we can leverage our social relationships, right, in a way that allow us to become amygdala whisperers. And what I mean by that is that we can regulate our arousal to the point where um, plasticity can become enhanced. Anxiety is the enemy of neuroplasticity. Okay. Um, the more anxious we become, the more cortisol becomes activated, the more adrenaline. There are all of these different biochemical processes and neuroanatomical activation patterns that occur. So when we're at moderate to, to um, high levels of arousal, our brain shuts down. We're capable of learning, but we're not capable of learning new information. We're pretty much reacting from our primitive brain to respond to trauma. So what we're doing in psychotherapy is using the relationship, a la Murray Bowen, a la Carl Rogers, a la you know, Heinz Kohut. We're using the relationship to, as a sociostatic device to regulate arousal, to get the brain into its neuroplastic sweet spot so that it's capable of learning and flexibility. So that's the key reason why therapy works. And it doesn't matter if you're talking about systems therapy, um, systematic desensitization, psychoanalysis, whatever. Every form of therapy reflects the recognition of the balance between challenge and support. And the um, underlying mechanism of action of that is this, um, our stress hormones and, and adrenaline and metabolic activation. Every form of therapy, if it's going to be successful, has to activate the brain in ways that change the brain. So this is one of the things that I, one of my goals is to not speak about any particular form of therapy, because then you get more into, you know, my form of therapy is better than yours. What I'm trying to do is figure out what is common to all forms of therapy. And I think these, some of these variables um, are it. So again, the amygdala whispering, a la, you know, most beautifully um, Carl Rogers, the um, balance of challenge and support wonderfully expressed in systematic desensitization where there is exposure to something that's a feared stimulus combined with relaxation and training, breathing exercises, whatever. Um, somatic therapies where you're using, um, where you're using the body both to uncover memories, but also to train someone to have control of their body in order to relax better, to enhance integration of different forms of therapy. 
meditation um, for you know falls into this uh, this category where we're learning how to observe the processes of mind and uh, and be able to use to make our mind our friend as opposed to our enemy, which is always giving us misinformation or leading us down the same blind trails over and over again. Let's see. I think those are the basic principles. And uh, just to, to end up, I've got a few more minutes ago. I just wanted to touch on this issue of, uh, of core shame. So we'll go to that. We've got a slide there. Let's see what slide do I want to... Actually, I'm not so sure the slides are that important. Let me, let me just talk about this. Um, and re, uh, refresh what I said before, is that I think what core shame is, is a kind of unfortunate, unfortunately conserved phenomena that was a mechanism of social organization when we were very primitive that now gets manifest in our, our brains or in our minds, I should say, as a sense of worthlessness, unlovability, feeling like a fraud, and leads to things like perfectionism, rage, social withdrawal, all of these things. So again, it's an unfortunate, um, unfortunate holdover from our primitive ancestors. Um, I've never in all of my life, both in all of my years of psycho personal psychotherapy and working with other people, I've never been able to completely clean out this uh, core shame, either for myself or other people. Um, what I notice, though, is that you can manage it. I think I think of it more in term, more like diabetes now than something that you can you can cure. There's something very deeply ingrained in us that will make us go to this sort of shame uh, core shame place, almost like a default mechanism. And so um, we have to anticipate that, and we have to develop a relationship with it. And it's connected to one other thing that I want to I want to stress, uh, you know, sort of as the last point is that I think that, and I'm not sure the reason for this exactly, but I think therapists undervalue, at least contemporarily, the value of anger. Um, I think that we do a lot of anger management because we're, we've become afraid of anger. But I think one of the things that was wonderful about the, the, you know, the movements of the 60s was the importance of expressing anger and rage. I think the men's movement tries to do this a bit. But I think that I, I remember one of the things my therapist told me long time ago. Um, he said, uh, imagine, imagine you're on a boat, right, as, you're, as a child, and you get the message from your family, from your parents, from your culture, whatever it is, that it's not acceptable to be angry. In other words, children should be seen and not heard. Um, and you shouldn't be angry. Look at all the things that you have, thank you have to be thankful for. But he said, OK, so imagine you're in this boat and you take your anger and you throw it overboard. But then you hear this noise and you notice there's a chain and the chain is, is, uh, is attached to your anger that you just threw overboard. But now it's also attached to your assertiveness, which also goes overboard. And then that goes overboard and you still hear noise. And then you notice it's attached to yet another, the chain's attached to another ball, which is your power. And both of those things go over the side. Okay. And what I think is true is that people with core shame experience lots of rage but they don't. And, but it's sort of an impotent rage. They don't experience their power or their assertiveness or their anger. And my suspicion is that what we need to learn how to do is to harness our anger. Because remember, anger, um, anger, and, uh, and and aggression. Actually, more specifically, aggression co-evolved with attachment because we needed to both nurture and protect, underline protect those people. Who um, you know who are, who are who are clinging to us, you know, for safety, and so one of the tools I've used in therapy is I try I use a, a simple tool where I know a lot I've had a lot of clients who are very afraid of expressing emotion, uh, especially negative emotion, their conflict avoidance, and they're overwhelmed with shame. Um, but I say, okay, imagine this: you're in a convenience store and you're getting some sodas and, and, and candy, and you see somebody taking your baby or your child by the hand and leading them out of the convenience store um, uh, trying to abduct them, what would you do? Um, would you be, you know, you're always so nice and polite and you let other people take advantage of you. What would you do? And men and women pretty much have the same response. Well, I would go over and I would rip their face off. I would bite their ears off. I would tear off their arms. I say, okay, now you're talking, right? There's the anger that's connected with protection, okay? And you've got to put yourself on the list of the person that you need to protect and realize that when these, uh, that the, the antidote, hopefully if there is an antidote, 
the antidote to core shame is power, anger, and assertion. You have to be able to tell your mind to um, go jump off a cliff. I can think of better words, but I'll do that for the uh, for this purpose. Okay, you have to tell your mind to uh, to get lost and that you're not listening to it. And this is you know just an artifact of history, and it has nothing to do with me. In fact, people with core shame generally are the most conscientious, law-abiding, generous people. Okay, they hardly ever are able to present any real things that they've done that are worthy of the amount of shame they experience, which is so, which is why I've come to believe that it doesn't really have anything to do with us, both of us, most of us anyway. It has something to do with this evolutionary conservation. Okay. And with that, I will um, conclude my words and let's move to some questions if anyone has any. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We do have many questions coming in. To begin, though, Lou, and I hope it's okay that I call you Lou. I could call you Dr. Casolino, but I feel so comfortable well, with good. you. You're, with so, Lou, you're so approachable. You're talking about the positive energy of anger, aggression, that protective energy. Mm -hmm. But obviously, anger can also be quite destructive when expressed to other people in certain situations. Mm -hmm. So could you just clarify... How do we know which type of anger is useful and when it's not useful? It can actually be quite destructive, as I said. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it really is contextual. And uh, like I, I would suspect that you would agree with me about the example that I gave. If, uh, you know, that's why there's all sorts of stories in the, in the folklore, too, about mothers lifting cars off their children and all of these, you know, all of these uh, the sort of folklore about it. Um, I think it, it, it's all contextual. If you're being protective, if you're, uh, if you're, and, and not just protective of other people, but protective of ourselves. In other words, one of the things that goes along with core shame is people not feeling like they have the right to be protected, or that because they question their own lovability. And so I think that just as an experiment, being willing to to use your own assertiveness for your own well-being is an important thing. To, and, and I think you should do this. I think we should all do this in collaboration with other people is to get feedback. What do you think about this situation? Am I, am, I reading the, am I reading it right? Am I being taken advantage of? Is it fair? And, um, you know, I think that we need to be able to learn um, appropriate assertiveness. And one of the things I love is, you know, one of the, one of the best treatments for psychosomatic illness, in other words, um, people who who don't express their feelings but become physically ill instead, one of the best treatments for those for folks is assertiveness training because what they need to do is get their emotions from their body to their right hemispheres over to their left and express. And that's what, you know, like if, someone's, if someone is, uh, is being, uh, you know, inappropriate and unfair, you express it. If you do that enough, you tend to give other people ulcers as opposed to get them yourself. But again, it's like there's no one rule because you have to look at the situation. But I encourage all of you, if someone's messing with your children, become a, uh, a tiger mom and rip their face off. Now, there's one other question that's come in on this topic of core shame. Mm -hmm. When you were talking about it earlier in the program, you were talking about the internalized fear of visibility mm -hmm. when you were talking about people becoming more alpha-like. Right. How... Do you see that people can grow in their courage to be more visible? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a lot of what happens in, in the psychotherapy that I do. I always think of therapy as, I mean, it's, it, the core is the relationship, but the mechanisms of change are the experiments. Okay? So I've had a lot of uh, clients who have you know, public speaking phobia, for example, or you know, anything like that. And it's all about um, giving people the tools to, you know, regulate amygdala activation. So they have to have relaxation, um, stress management techniques to, to lower amygdala activation so they actually can move towards their anxiety. Um, I think that's another key principle too, is anxiety can't be something that you move away from. You have to move towards it because every time you become anxious about something and you avoid it, you're giving your brain, your primitive brain, the signal that the avoidance correlates with survival. And so you have to have the courage to be anxious and, 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 and move forward anyway. And no one can do that you know, for you, but what a therapist or other people can do is figure out ways to make it as, as uh, 
you know, as doable as possible, and then you have to take the steps. I think there's a good follow-up question here. This has come in from a person named Jessen who writes, what are some ways that we can employ fear modulation on the amygdala at a practical level when we're activated outside of a therapeutic setting in the mm -hmm. workplace or at home? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the, one of the things that comes to mind first is, uh, it's a, just a little technique that Donald Meichenbaum, who many of you probably know of, uh, used in, in one of his trainings was the, uh, what happens is that as our, as our amygdala becomes activated and we're having, um, sympathetic arousal is our respiration increases. And he used this thing where, um, where he said, okay, imagine that you're drinking a spoon of hot soup or you want to drink a spoon of hot soup and you, you want to blow on it to cool it off, but you don't want to blow on it too hard so that you blow the soup out of the spoon. And what that does is it's, it, it uh, entrains your breathing. It slows your breathing to give your auto autonomic nervous system the message that, that you're safe, that things are okay, and it provides a feedback loop. Okay, so that's that's something that you can do mechanically. I think also just what I try to do with uh, with many of my clients is I, I invest time in creating an internal imaginal space that they can go to or that they can be in simultaneously when they're out and about in the world. Okay, so if they're about to, if they're stuck in traffic, if they're about to go up on a stage or whatever's going on, or if their kids are driving them crazy or they're about to have an argument with their spouse that they can remember, I'm thinking of one particular poignant one, you know, I, um, they can remember that this one fellow had a playroom where he and his brother played as six and seven years old, seven year old, right before their father died. And it was the last memory he had of feeling safe in the world. His mom, mom and dad were leading, you know, like looking in the doorway at the two of them playing and they were smiling at them. And uh, he remembers he felt like, all was right in the world. And then, you know, I don't know if it was hours later or a day later, his father died. And so he, his brain paired happiness and safety with loss and trauma. Okay? And so whenever he was about to do something or actually whenever he was feeling good, he started worrying. It's like, uh-oh, what's going to happen now? Because the amygdala is kind of dumb in that way. It'll pair anything with anything. Right? It, can comp it can pair love with abandonment, you compare love with abuse. And we see this all the time. So those are two things. It's sort of that imaginal space and also breathing techniques can be helpful. And whatever, obviously... So circling back for a moment... Sure. Carla writes, I've always been afraid of my anger because I grew up in a volatile household. Mm -hmm. You mentioned some antidotes, and I'd like to know how to work with these on a daily basis when it scares me that I'll do irreparable damage to my relationship. Relationships when mm -hmm. I express less than positive sides of myself. I was, I was, my therapist could see that I was holding in my anger. And he said, he said a wonderful thing. He said, just so imagine what would happen if you let your anger go. And the, immediately the vision that came to my mind, I was in a, uh, in a high rise. Um, and the, the image, the image I had was sort of like when the planes at the world trade center, that his office would explode and we would both be killed and all the glass would fly out of the windows and there'd be this huge, you know, firestorm. And I think that was, you know, for me, it was both watching the, the rage that would be exhibited. Like no one expressed negative emotions in my family until they were over the edge. So it was always, it was always explosive. It was always on their way out the door. Um, and so I became very afraid of my feelings, um, you know, to any kind of negative feelings. And again, I think it goes back to this notion of, of, of power and assertion. If you can figure out how to be appropriately assertive and appropriately powerful, okay? That what happens then is you, you exercise those muscles and you, I think it's, this is sort of a, like going back to Freud's hydraulic model, you start to, um, to, to vent or to, to decrease the pressure 
in some of these other experiences. And also with a therapist too, you have to identify where you're vulnerable because if you're afraid, for example, if you're afraid of, of uh, exploding at a loved one, perhaps there are all sorts of things that you need to discuss with them in a reasonable way that haven't been discussed. Or it could be that you have a whole history of being you know, abused by others and this is the, the most convenient target. Okay, so I think that what you need to do is figure out what the architecture um, of this of your implicit memory is, and figure out how to work with that first. First, get the diagnosis, and I don't mean of the of your illness, but I mean the diagnosis of the architecture of what gets created in that vital half second, and then go about figuring ways to work around it, to deconstruct it, to um, to do positive actions in any way you can, and have the courage. It's usually not the courage to be angry that's the problem it's the courage to be honest right and if if being honest with your feelings has always resulted in abandonment or abuse or something like that then that's the thing you're going to avoid and the lack of honesty i think results in in all kinds of anger so it may not be the anger it may be something underneath the anger that needs to be explored and that may take a lot more courage and then one other question on this topic, and then we'll move on. There's uh, many different things to cover. But Evelyn writes, I see many people who express anger as a cover for shame. Is there a way to deal directly with the shame? Right. Well, I would say, again, I, I, my experience, and I, you know, I doubt I'm completely right about this because I doubt I'm completely right about anything. But um, with people with, um, with core shame, their anger is usually rage. In other words, it's relating to not feeling appreciated, understood, loved, you know, all of that stuff. And so um, my suspicion is that you know, when, when you're dealing with core shame, what you have to do is get to those feelings, the, the feelings of, uh, of abandonment, of, of unlovability, and really of, of self-acceptance that come underneath that, uh, that, that are underneath the rage. Again, this is a very difficult thing. There's no, um, there's no feel good manual. You know, I, I've read lots of books about how to heal shame and I've tried all kinds of things with all kinds of people, including myself. And again, I think it has to do with learning to manage it, to continuing to chip away at it, taking pieces of it wherever you can and, um, and doing your best to, uh, to work around some of the stuff that may always be there because this stuff is wired hard and deep. Okay. A general question that came in is, why do you call neuroscience a metaphor? This is the Neuroscience Training Summit, after all. Mm -hmm. Why do you refer to neuroscience as a metaphor? Well, I think every, um, every science, every um, philosophical school, every psychological school is a kind of metaphor for reality. We can't know reality directly. We don't really know what that is. What we do is we create systems that create certain um, windows to, to reality, and we can move from metaphor to metaphor because there are people, you know, um, biologists look at, at you know, they, they look at the brain at a molecular level. Phys uh, physicists look at the brain in a, in a different way. Systems, uh, you know, chaos. People from chaos theory uh, look at it from a different way. So all of these things may be legitimate ways to, to um, you know, to parse reality. But they're all heuristics. They're all metaphors. They're, they're always one step away from whatever it is out there that we're trying to understand. Remember, we have we're a biological organism with a bunch of neurons that are trying to understand the universe. So we may very much be akin to, you know, an ant walking across your keyboard who's trying to understand how a computer works. Sobering. <laughs> well, relaxing, too. Like, take it easy. Don't be so uptight about all this stuff. Roger writes in, from the perspective of a neuroscientific lens, what's the goal of psychotherapy? Is it merely, as Freud said, a workable relationship and love and work? Or in your view, something more. Well, I don't. I, I think that they're the same. In other words, what a, you know, there's nothing about human existence or biological life that's perfect. Perfect is as a construction. It's an abstract. Um, I think Freud's idea about uh, you know working in therapy uh, or being in therapy, the point where you can love and work, 
I think what that expresses is that we're here really to be generative. We're here to have babies. We're here to contribute to our tribe. And beyond that, everything else is sort of, uh, con, you know, it's sort of a, a construction, a confabulation. The, uh, the biological mandates are such that uh, we reproduce and we support our group. Um, and so I think that's the goal. I think Freud had it. Freud was a Darwinist. Um, he didn't have any fantasies about perfection. And he said, you know, like, the, you know, like when, you, when people ask him, when, did, when do you terminate therapy? And he says, well, you can always find more things to work on but the, um, or to talk about. But the real, the real uh, sort of uh, scale is whether or not you've rubbed off some of the sharp edges that are keeping you from uh, performing your role in the world. And I think that's pretty much it. I don't think neurobiology offers us anything more than that because neurobiology is understood through the lens of culture. So every culture is going to look at neurobiology and probably have different expectations. In the same way, Christians looked at evolution and adapted it to say that we're evolving towards some godlike ideal. Um, it's just a, you know, it's a construction. That's not what Darwin had in mind, um, and that's not really what evolution appears to be up to. In terms of what's possible, in terms of growth and change in a lifetime, Stephanie writes in. You say that our brain's evolution has wired us to make assumptions and judgments based on social and cultural history. How likely is it that we might fundamentally shift our biases in our lifetimes? Um, well, I guess I guess it depends how you define fundamentally. Um, I remember for me uh, with uh, with Obama's election, for example, that was uh, that happening was something that was nowhere nowhere in any of my wiring or expectations from childhood. So if you consider um, if you consider that fundamental, then fundamental change has occurred. And you would hope that over time as we become more open to diversity that uh, and, and see diversity not as a threat, which is what we're more wired to do from our, our primitive tribal brains, to see it more as an opportunity for expansion and learning, then I think that could be a fundamental change. Um, but I guess it really would depend on how you define my fundamentals. Several questions have come in related to storytelling and changing our narrative. Mm -hmm. And here's one from Mary who writes, regarding stories that involve negative events, do they keep the person swirling in negative energy? How do you jump from citing the negative and feeling that energy to transforming it to the positive energy and a feeling of relief? Mm -hmm. That's a very wonderful question. It's also um, incredibly complicated. Um, one, of the, one of the cases that I wrote up in, uh, in a book was um, I had a, a client who was a Holocaust survivor. He was a young child during the Holocaust. His family was taken away to a camp. And uh, the, the family, the neighbor family, kind of like Anne Frank, took him in and kept him uh, hidden in closets. And he spent the day in an internal courtyard where they would put a piece of furniture in front of the door to the courtyard every day. So he spent the war riding on a tricycle in a circle in this little cobblestone uh, courtyard. And um, he never told – he had a lot of grandchildren. He, uh, he had made a wonderful adaptation still carried all of this pain, of course, so whatever, how many ever years later, 50 years later or so. Um, but one of the things we did was, uh, was in this story was I, I co-edited the story with him and his, tri his uh, tricycle became a magic tricycle, which allowed him to pass through walls and, uh, and uh, you know, be invisible. So he could drive down the street, he could goose Nazis, he could go visit his grandmother, he could do all kinds of things. So what he did with this, uh, I think, with the modification of the story was he was able to not only add positive and, and more uh, efficacious actions to the memory. And after telling, co, you know, co-constructing the story over time, he was never able again to remember the courtyard without the additions that we had made. And it was probably because over the years he had done a lot of healing as well. But it also allowed him to tell his grandchildren the story. Because that and that seemed to be another important part of his healing as well, is 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 using his Holocaust experiences 
to talk about philosophy as principles and values. He was able to use the story in a generative way um, with his family, and it seemed to have a, a very deep and profound effect on his own healing and, and moving forward. So I think modifying the story is important, but you've got to add new information, you know, A, and B, the story has to be told in, in, a, in a low to moderate level of arousal. So you have to do some amygdala whispering or construct something as part of the storytelling that allows plasticity to occur where the story can be modified as opposed to being told in a stereotype repetitive way, which only digs those you know, neural connections deeper and makes the trauma more impactful. Sylvia writes in Related, she writes, I agree that the permission to tell our stories is a big part of healing, but outside of therapy, how do we go about finding these safe spaces to continue this work? Hmm. Well, I think AA is a good example of that. Um, the, any kind of you know, uh, support group or group therapy where people can, um, you know, can work on that gives them the chops to, um, to be able to experiment with it outside of uh, sort of personal relationships that may be, you know, may be dangerous because you may be misunderstood or criticized or whatever, um, you know, that's a, that's a really, that's a wonderful question. And um, I think it's, it's up to all of us. And I think it's really um, a, an important part of therapy to make sure that therapy general, uh, generalizes outside of the consulting room so that what you're doing is, uh, is really uh, working with your clients to be able to work on actively bringing these things into their lives. Because there are so many clients that become really good therapy clients, but nothing changes outside of the, of the consulting room. And, um, you know, again, I think that's just a part of, that's a part of the perspective of a therapist. The brain, you know, we're all capable of having multiple discrete personalities or reactions to different contexts. And I mean, I, I've known people that have been in psychoanalysis for 25 years and their therapist never knew they were an alcoholic, just never came. They were, they were never asked. And so they never brought it up. Now, can you say more about how a good therapist would help their client generalize the learning in psychotherapy to the rest of their life? What would the therapist do to make sure they're covering that? Yeah, well, I, I think basically attending to the types of relationships. In other words, how, how isolated, how isolating is, uh, are they when it comes to therapy versus the rest of life? Is this, very, is this a very dissociated, separate experience or are they using therapy and are you working together to create experiments and living that force them to do the things and accomplish the things they want to do? Cheryl writes in a question, very practical question. She writes, what are some specific practical things I can do to get the amygdala to stand down when I get anxious about the simplest tasks sometimes, making a phone call, completing important paperwork, or even making decisions? Mm -hmm. Well, again, I think uh, two things. I, I, I uh, kind of going back to a previous question. You can do mechanical things as, as a you know, in, in line with breathing exercises, contemplate, you know, meditation, contemplation, visual imagery. There are a whole raft of tools, uh, you know, that uh, are available for that. And um, I think the other piece of it is exploring the triggers. In other words, what are in those implicit memory circuits that are um, that are activating anxiety in situations that really shouldn't make you anxious. It, they're not random. They're connected to something. If you're sitting down to do paperwork and you're getting anxious, there's a symbolic value to that. There's a meaning to that. And so be, what, you know, what we need to do is get to the bottom of what those associations are and then be able to do the amygdala whispering and the work in those areas as well. Um, EMDR is a wonderful, uh, a wonderful intervention for that. You can go into EMDR being curious about why you panic when you sit down to do paperwork. And, you know, there's a good chance that what EMDR will help you do is not only, uh, help you uncover how your brain is organized, uh, you know, around this, this experience, but also help you to, uh, you know, to desensitize yourself and uncouple the real life threatening situation from the thing that seems so simple to other people. Ken has written in a question here that maybe you can help unpack for the rest of our listeners. He writes, 
Where do you place memory reconsolidation and unlocking the emotional brain in your conceptualization of why therapy works? Unlocking the emotional brain and memory reconsolidation. Well, I think um, going back to EMDR, I mean, I think that that's kind of the, what EMDR focuses on. One of the things we see in post-traumatic stress uh, sufferers, for example, is that when they're exposed to uh, uh, novel stimuli or new input, instead of salient circuitry and, and learning circuitry get activated, which is more in the frontal part of the brain, um, what gets activated is more posterior autobiographical memory. And so memory reconsolidation has to be triggered by um, circuitry that's involved with memory updating. It's the type of thing that should happen in REM sleep. It's the type of thing that, uh, you know, that uh, EMDR works with. And I think it's the type of thing on a much slower basis that historical psychoanalysis worked in. And that's really what, what uh, you know, working through means is, you know, can to be getting the interpretation, being open to new information, um, being soothed by the supporting aspects of therapy from the therapist and slowly getting exposed to the, you know, the content that's difficult to process objectively. And so what you're looking at really is the reorganization of emotional and neural circuitry and, uh, you know, to update memory. That really is the underlying the process, apparently, of what's going on. Unlocking the emotional brain, I, it's hard to know exactly what, uh, you know, what the questioner means by that. But, um, you know, there are certain, there are certain, uh, you know, because one way to think about it would be sort of right hemisphere amygdala bias circuits where trauma is, is stored and inhibited. And what you want to do is disinhibit that in order to, uh, to have it available. You know, uh, I don't know if you would call that, uh, you know, catharsis or abreaction uh, individual case and the artistry and knowledge of the therapist, which is why I kind of, uh, I shy away a little from giving um, hard and fast advice or, or guidance because uh, everything is so case specific and uh, manualized treatments are manualized treatments.